Okay, next, let's talk about fur. All right, so um, I'm going to preface this by saying I completely understand the some of the ethical concerns that uh, the individuals have over the fur industry. Um, I consider myself an ethical person, but I, I, I love fur. <laughs> I hate to say it, I have a few pieces. I do have a few pieces. I completely understand the rationale um, why some people um, choose not to wear fur. Um, I wear real fur. I wear um, I wear, wear faux fur as well. Um, I actually have a, a, a two pieces in my in my closet. One is a vintage Persian lamb's wool coat, um, and the other one is a newer. Uh, I think I bought it maybe three years ago. Faux, faux fur le, Persian lamb's wool coat. Um, I I say that was really a genuine teddy bear fur. Um, so I, I, I understand the, the ethical concerns that, that some of you may have. So I apologize and put this on you, but you, we will, it, it is something that we use in the fashion industry. It is one of the textile beauty. So we will have to talk about it. Okay. Um, predating, right? Predating cotton and linen, you know, the crops, um, that were used to make the fibers that made the yarn that were woven into cloth. Um, people wore fur and fur was just a byproduct of of animals that were killed in order to for, for consumption and you know in in the hunter gatherer and scavenger world you wasted nothing so fur is one of our oldest is one of our oldest textiles and um you know they figured out how to use it they used it on their bodies they used it in their spaces you know to cover their floors actually even to even cover some of their dwellings um, because it is a it's an insulated right that's why animals in cold weathers can survive with just their fur by the time we reach the middle ages though actually by the time we get to history <laughs> we uh, weren't using fur in the same in the same manner uh, in all parts of the world but by the time we get to the middle ages fur was just an announcement a symbol uh, of your wealth um, you know you didn't need to wear fur you wanted to wear fur and you know for centuries um, in, in many northern European uh, countries, um, fur was had its weight in gold. And um, when we look at the at the dawn of, of our country, we talked about how cotton was a cash crop. It was one of the things that that really um, began our eco the economic engine that we that we know as, as American economy today. Um, fur was in there as well, and uh, more so in um, the upper. Um, Geographically, which, which I call it, geographically, it's the Midwest, but it's the Upper Midwest. So we'll we'll say like Detroit, Michigan, Wisconsin, those areas, and Canada. Um, you know the um, the amount and supply and variety of wild animals that were able to be trapped um, trapped for fur was phenomenal, and that it was an economic boom. Um, you know, fur traders uh, partnered with or conquered <laughs> Indian. Uh, sorry, indigenous tribes to um, to harvest the pelts of you know, beavers and minks and otters, and some of them almost almost to to extinction. So, the fur industry has a long storied history right alongside that of of human history. So, fur as an industry isn't new. <laughs> um, like again, it has dated back to to prehistory. Um, uh, and like I said, the plentiful supply and variety of, of furs was able to help the colonists of, of the United States and of of, um, of, Can of Canada. And, um, you know, more than any other time in history, the, the, the types of furs that were available were long and varied. There are some um, animals that are used for fur that are indigenous to, to the United States. To the North and South America, also the United States, uh, North and, and South America. Um, you know, things like beaver, which you're like, why would you want to kill a cute little beaver, or a cute monk, or a cute chinchilla? Um, but they were um, integral to the um, growing up of our economy. Um, you know, and then we go, I'm, we go super fast forward, right? We're going to fast forward to, you know, us in a more contemporary context. Um, has seen animal rights activists um, and the, the growth of the understanding that should we be growing animals only to kill them to use their skin. So the majority of animals that are used in the fur in, in the fur trade are not 
um, using any other method. So at least with leather, um, they're a byproduct. You know, with wool, uh, the sheep are shorn. They're not actually um, killed. Um, when we talk about vicuna, uh, they're they're shorn. They're not killed anymore. Um, and so there, the 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 hair, the process, the yarn, the fiber is a byproduct. Whereas with fur, it is not a byproduct. It is the it is the sole the sole um, the sole product. So now industry, the, the fur industry is hit on a number of fronts, and it also has a I don't want to say ebb and flow, but there are times when fur is trendy, right? It's trendier, um, and that's definitely at a time when when PETA is able to. Um, is where PETA is seen as more vocal. They're vocal all the time, but they're seen as more vocal when the trend, uh, the trend for fur is higher, or when some celebrity <laughs> steps out or too much fur, PETA is there to, uh, to state their purpose, or to state their their mission. Okay, um, but you know the, the beauty is with the advancements in fiber production. So we're gonna talk about synthetic fiber production uh, on the next set of slides for the lecture. On the next tab of the lecture. Um, Hopefully in a couple of days, the, the the manufacturer of synthetic fibers that mimic the hand and the feel and the suppleness um, are have improved. And there used to be a time where fake fur was like, oh, fake fur was beneath, a, you know, was beneath a serious designer. And you know now it's it's everywhere, and especially it's especially faux fur is on is on trend right now. So these technological um, developments that began in the 80s and continue through today and the push of animal rights act activists has has saw um, that that manufacturing um, push forward so much that we really don't call it fake fur anymore we call it faux <laughs> we call it faux fur um so we we just take them you know when you take a french word it makes it sound fancy so that's why the other part of the lecture is part d <laughs> which is just two right so when we use a, a different word um, we use a different word sometimes, it, it changes the connotation. And faux fur actually has had um, some great, great advancements. And it is, um, for many ethical um, designers, it is seen as not only just the alternative to faux fur, but the only usage of fur that they, that they, would, that they would allow. So very briefly, um, you know, fur processing, um, much like leather processing um, is multi is a, is a multi-step so manufacturers purchase their pelts or the skins um, from uh, from a supplier so someone who breeds and raises the fur um, you know there are even within the, the same type of fur there are quality standards so there's always a good better best um, oftentimes the good better best quality of the fur depends on the breed and the health of the animal and how they were cared for Will all determine the the type of hand, so the feel, the feel that, that they get, um, and then you know there's a whole host of chemical and mechanical processes that the fur uh, goes to on the underside, so not necessarily well, it's not true on the outside too, but on the underside to make it pliable and easily um, usable as a fabric. Additionally, there's some dyeing processes that you see, so the the garment on the on the left is a natural, um, a natural color uh, beaver fur hat. The garment on the right, on um, on the other hand, has been dyed. That is not a natural, naturally occurring um, color for a for an animal. I mean, for for a fur. Um, and you know, most fur manufacturers are small, independently owned um, businesses or operated shops. So, you know, there's a, a handful of, of big players, but for the most part. Um, you know, these are done by small, independent, independent, uh, independent, independent, I can get it out, independent organizations. And, you know, the, the retail distribution of fur comes all over the place. Like, you will see uh, real fur distributed in places like, you know, Nordstrom's and, and, and Saks and private, you know, manufacturers, uh, private retailers, but you also will see some fur uh, in, you know, Macy's and, I don't say lower end, but in some other, <laughs> in, in middle to lower end contemporary stores as well. As a general rule, though, you know, the demand for fur is really related to the economy. Fur is a luxury item. Uh, and so depending on how much discretionary money folks, how much discretionary funds uh, an economy has will determine what the demand, demand for, for fur is. So, you know, 
Obviously, in the Great Depression, the demand for fur dropped. Uh, you know, in the 70s, it has dropped, and it has seen a resurgence uh, since uh, since the recession. But more importantly, the you know the introduction of high quality faux synthetic manufactured furs are walking hand in hand with with actual um, you know real fur, right? Real fur, and you know, in many instances. Um, they are sold together, right? So a a a store like Nordstrom's or Saks will have, you know, their fur and their faux fur items either in the same department or in close proximity, just based on on the design and the contemporaneous of it. Uh, and then the other thing is the trend in color. Um, and traditionally, fur was left in its natural state. It you, you know may have been dyed a darker black or a darker brown, but we do see the trend in color in fur. So that's where we're going to finish up for now. You have gotten leather and 